Well, tomorrow is uh, President's Day, and the kids here thought that they were getting a day out of school, but they're going to get a little history lesson tonight. At least that's what I hope, you know. But um, thinking about President's Day, I felt it appropriate for us to maybe look at um, the, the subject of prayer from another perspective. If you would, please turn your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. And we're going to start uh, with the uh, second chapter, 1 Timothy, second chapter. We're going to start in uh, verse 1. It's on the screen, but when you're there, everybody say amen. All right, that's good. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, it says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Now, the Apostle Peter tells us that God's not willing that any should perish, that all would come to repentance. Amen. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I want to use for a thought tonight, in light of President's Day, pray for our leaders. The story goes that when Abraham Lincoln was about to leave from his home in Springfield, Illinois, to go to Washington to begin his presidency, he stood up on a train platform and addressed all of his friends and neighbors who were there to wish him well on his journey. Understanding that he had come to be the president during one of the most challenging times of our young nation, he said, well, friends and neighbors, there is one thing you can do for me that I ask you to do, and that is pray for me. <laughs> this great man, this great president, he understood the necessity of prayer. If there's ever been a time in our nation's history in which we needed to pray for our president, it was then, and that time is certainly now. We are living in what the Bible refers to as perilous times. These are dangerous times, and it is vitally important that we as the church pray for our leaders in our great nation. Our nation faces many enemies of freedom and of the cross, and many of these enemies are our leaders. But let me remind you what Ephesians 6.12 says. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our enemy are not those people, but the spirit behind those people, the spirit that drives those people, the spirit that influences those people. We are continually at war with the enemy of our soul, so we must heed the words of Jesus who taught us to pray thusly. Matthew 6, 13 says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's how we ought to be praying. Deliver us from evil. President Lincoln requested prayer, and Scripture commands that we pray for our leaders. So as children of God, we are to obey and lift up our leaders. Amen. But why? Why are we instructed to pray for our leaders? To answer that question, let's look at where we began as a nation, where we've come. Let's look at our first president, George Washington. The very first thing our nation's first president did as his first official act as president was to acknowledge God in prayer. While taking oath of office, President Washington placed his left hand on the Bible, and he ended the oath with the now famous words, So help me God. These two things, the placing of the hand on the Bible and the words, So help me God, they were not required in the Constitution, but he did it out of reverence for God and his word. And every president since has followed suit. History also states that he then knelt down and kissed the Bible that he used during his oath. He is also famously quoted as saying, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. And I say amen. Let's look at our third president, Thomas Jefferson. Now, oftentimes he's the most misrepresented president of all when it comes to his spiritual views. He's the author of the Declaration of Independence, and he prayed, Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable ministry, sound learning, and pure manners. 
Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endow with thy spirit wisdom those whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law we may show forth thy praise among the nations of earth. In time of press prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All of which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That was Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, our third president. That was his prayer. He acknowledges Jesus Christ as Lord. Our fourth president, James Madison, also known as the father of the Constitution, he said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to what? The commandments of God. The future and success of America is not in this Constitution, he said, but in the laws of God upon upon which this Constitution is founded. That's what he said, and that's what our founding fathers believed. Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president, said, America was born a Christian nation. Did you hear that? America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. It is no mystery that our great nation was founded upon Christian principles and established and intended to be a Christian nation, period. I don't care who wants to argue that. There is no argument to that fact. That is where we came from, so now let's take a look at where we've come. In stark contrast to the vision that our founding fathers and our past presidents had, on June 28, 2006, Obama said, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Now those are his words. Those are not minced words, those are his words. That's what he said. He said, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. And Obama's statement, as much as I hate to agree, is somewhat true. I I say somewhat, Loosely, because although this nation is certainly founded upon Christian principles, it is evident, it is evident that we have forsaken God as a nation. Abraham Lincoln once said, we have forgotten God. And this is Abraham Lincoln. All those years back, he said this, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Does that sound familiar? Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. President Abraham Lincoln. Ronald Reagan. On my birthday, August 23rd, 1984, he said, our, he's our 40th president. He said, without God... There is no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. Without God, we're mired in the material, that flat world that tells us only what our senses perceive. Without God, there is a coarsening of the the society. And without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. And then he uttered these famous words, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Sadly, President Reagan's words are unfolding before our very eyes. Would you agree? Obama's statement that we are no longer a Christian nation was intended as a compliment, and he said it in a boastful manner as if to brag, but it's actually an indictment on our nation. And even more importantly, it's an indictment on the church. It's a blatant slap in the face of our history and the principles of our founding fathers. Ultimately, it's a slap in the face of God who established our great nation to be a nation that would spread the gospel of his dear son, Jesus, to all the world. We have failed as a church. And I believe our greatest failure is our failure to heed the command of God to pray, and more specifically, to pray for our leadership and to pray for our nations. We often hear all the time, pray for one another, pray, you know, pray for this, pray for that, God, got to do this, got to do that. It's, it's rare, maybe once, once a year sometimes when you hear, pray for our leaders. That's where we failed. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that our country is in a deep moral and spiritual decline. Instead of heeding the black and white words of Almighty God, we would rather be entertained and self-indulged by 50 shades of gray. We can stick our heads in the sand and act like we're still a Christian nation, nation based on the majority that claims to have some connection with Christianity, but we, be, we would be misled to believe that all is well in these United States of America. 
Time doesn't permit me to list one by one all of the acts of our current president and his administration that reveal the substance behind his opinion that we are no longer a Christian nation. But allow me a few moments to share some of them with you. I don't have them for the screen. Just please just follow me quickly. In January, and this, by the way, these are the first, about the first three years of his presidency, which you can usually determine what a person's going to do in their first term. In January 2009, Obama decides to use U.S. taxpayer funds to start paying for abortions and abortion counseling in other countries. In April 2009, Obama makes a speech at Georgetown University and insists that a Jesus, a Jesus symbol be covered up while he is speaking. In May 2009, Obama breaks White House tradition by refusing to host the National Day uh, Prayer Day services. However, the White House does host the Islamic fast-breaking dinner of Ramadan. July 2009, Obama violated the Federal Defense of Marriage Act by extending benefits to same-sex partners of employees of the executive branch along with those in the Foreign Service Division. 2010, the White House, throughout the whole year, the White House purposely refrains from making any official proclamations or statements involving biblical holidays, while at the same time acknowledges publicly and celebrates Muslim holidays. April 2010, the Obama-led Pentagon, Pentagon canceled the invitation to Reverend Franklin Graham, the son of Reverend Billy Graham, to participate in their National Day of Prayer due to complaints from Muslims. August 2010, Obama speaks in favor of the proposal to build a mosque at Ground Zero, which is, to me is just crazy, but says nothing about the Christian church that was denied to rebuild at the exact same site. October 19, 2010, Obama intentionally avoids the phrase, the creator, when he quotes the Declaration of Independence. And to date, to the best of my knowledge, he's done this at least seven times. November 2010, Obama purposely quotes our national motto as e pluris unum, which means out of many, one, instead of in God we trust, which was established by Congress in 1956. January 2011, the Obama administration violates federal law and U.S. Supreme Court rulings and refuses to allow a World War I memorial in the form of a cross located in the Mojave Desert to be transferred to private ownership or to allow the cross to be erected, erect, re-erected after it was ordered to be removed. June 2011, references to God and Jesus during burial ceremonies at Houston National Cemetery are forbidden by the Department of Veteran Affairs. September 2011, the Army instructs Walter Reed Medical Center to halt anyone from giving away Bibles, religious reading materials, or any other religious items during visitation. November 2011, the U.S. Air Force Academy stops supporting Operation Christmas Child because it is run by a Christian charity, Reverend Franklin Graham's ministry. The operation supplies gifts to underprivileged children throughout the world. This is a ministry that we personally support every year during Christmas. In the same month, November 2011, the same U.S. Air Force Academy used $80,000 worth of taxpayer funds to erect Stonehenge-like worship centers for pagans, druids, witches, and Wiccans. January 2012, Obama administration declares that the First Amendment does not protect churches and synagogues and their hiring of ministers and rabbis. It's ridiculous. September 2012, Obama, addressing the United Nations General Assembly, said the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. And much more could be included in this. I mean, we're just, we're just through 2012. But recently, we're aware that Obama equates the terrorist group ISIS with historical Christianity. And that is absolutely ridiculous. I don't reveal these things with any specific political agenda. I don't claim to be a Republican or a Democrat, and nor do I completely agree with all those who profess conservatism. I'm a Christian, and my worldview is based upon what thus saith the word of the Lord. That's my political view <laughs> right here. And I know that that's the political view of this church, of our staff, of our pastor. We stand by what thus saith the word of the Lord. It's also not my intent to put Obama in a bad light. I, my, in my opinion, he does a good enough job on his own. But I say all these things to demonstrate just how desperately we need to be praying for our leaders. It would certainly appear that if it's not actually true that we are no longer a Christian nation, we are definitely and swiftly heading that direction. But what if this were the end? What if it all ended right here and this was the end of my message? If we concluded here, then we're left with despair and hopelessness, right? <laughs> but brothers and sisters, let me remind you something. Regardless who may reside in the Oval Office, we serve a God, an almighty God, who sits on the throne. And nothing can change that. And his word declares in Proverbs 21, 
Verse 1, the king's heart is like a stream of water, directed by the Lord. By who? Directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. Our God holds the hearts of kings, presidents, leaders, all in his hands. Yes, even the heart of Obama is in the hand of our God. Our opening passage of Scripture is quite revealing if we have some historical background. Paul the Apostle is writing to young Timothy during a time in which the wicked Emperor Nero ruled the vast empire of Rome. In those days, Christians were viciously persecuted. They were sometimes clothed in wild animal skins and put in the arena before hungry lions. They were even covered in pitch, and they were lit on fire and used as human lanterns to light the streets of Rome. And in fact, not long after Paul wrote the words of our opening text, he would then be martyred by this Nero. So for Paul to request Timothy to pray for the leaders of his day required that he also pray for deranged Nero. Think about that. The point is that whether we agree with them or not, whether we like them or not, we still have a responsibility to pray for our leadership. Regardless what we feel, regardless, listen, I have strong opinions about our current administration. I'm sure a lot of you do too. (laughs) That does not negate the, the, the fact that God requires us as children of God to pray for our leaders. Proverbs 14.34 says this, very famous, righteousness exalts a nation. There may not be much righteousness evident in society or in government, but let it be said that the church is righteous. Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That tells me that there's hope. We can still impact those around us, and one by one we can affect our society for Christ. But this all begins with prayer. The famous prayer passage found in 2 Chronicles reveals what we ought to do in these perilous times. 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, my people. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we pray for our leaders, God may change their hearts. Think about that which very well could change the course of history. Think about all of our past presidents, all of our past leaders who followed God. Why did they follow God? Because somebody taught them the ways of God. Somebody prayed for them. There's praying grandmas, praying moms. There's even a picture of George Washington before he's even to take his presidency where he's kneeling down in front of his mom, and his mom's got her her hands laid upon his head. It's a painting, a famous painting. It's called a mother's uh, blessing. If we pray for our leaders, God can change their hearts. And it could change the course of history. Everything that we just talked about could completely be changed. But if we fail to pray, then we forfeit the promise of God. Let us, church, not fail. And I echo the words of our first president, George Washington. And we should echo those same words when he humbly prayed, so help us God. Because let me tell you, that's what it takes. It takes us being humble, humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God, submitting ourselves to his authority, to his word. And regardless what we think of our president, regardless what we think of those in administration, we humbly say, oh God, if you don't change their hearts, they're going to hell. God, if you don't save them, this nation will be destroyed. So I challenge us as a church tonight to make a commitment, to make a commitment to pray for our nation, to pray even for our president, pray for our leaders. And I even mean pray for your church leadership. Pray for our pastor. Oh my goodness, he needs prayer. He needs our strength. He needs to feel the strength of God from the saints of God praying for him. Pray for our staff. We need your prayers. We need the direction of the Lord. Our president needs the direction of the Lord. The direction we're going right now is not of the Lord. Now, I know that God is orchestrating things. I know that God is on the throne. I know that he's using all these different things to fulfill eternity. I understand that, to fulfill his will. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to still pray and to watch God at work in lives, in the hearts of those who lead us. Amen.